Welcome to the final lecture for week four and the final lecture for the entire course. In this lecture, I'm going to look at the question of citizen engagement by uh, examining differences between engagement at the local and state level and at the national level. I've been teaching politics for a long time, and I mostly teach national politics, and uh, that is the level that most people think of when they think of politics. Almost all of the attention is paid on national politics, Washington, D.C. as the power center. One of the things that's kind of interesting about the coronavirus uh, pandemic that we're in now is that we're actually seeing a lot of local and state action that is different from uh, federal action. And we're getting different messaging and different uh, approaches at the local and state level and at the national level. And that's raising awareness of something that has always been true in the American political system is that politics uh, is occurs and is played out at various levels. That's what it means to have a federal system. But most of the air, uh, most of the oxygen is uh, in the media environment is sucked up uh, at the national level. And because we live in a highly mediated society, this is uh, what I started the course by talking about, we live in a highly mediated society where basically not only our information, but our uh, engagement and our participation occurs through the political media, uh, not entirely, but largely, when national politics occupies all or nearly all of the oxygen of the media landscape, then state and local politics really doesn't get paid much attention to except by the very small group of people who are directly involved in it. So that's actually already talking about one of the reasons why there is a difference of engagement at the local and state and the national levels is that uh, there's a, a differential level of attention paid to it. Um, the notes here uh, for this final lecture are type notes in a chart form that essentially compare and contrast the opportunities available at each of these levels and the obstacles uh, that people face in participating and having an impact at these levels. I'm not going to go through and read every single one of the bullet points because you can do them yourself, but I, but I will read some of them. And mostly what I want to do is just sort of contrast the opportunities at the local and state and the national levels and the obstacles to them. Um, uh, opportunities, right? Why engagement at this level could and should be compelling. Uh, at the local and state level, uh, there's a very low level of engagement. Uh, and uh, that is despite the fact that engagement at this level could and should be very compelling. Now, I, I'm always a little wary when I say should, because that can often have a kind of a moral tinge to it. Uh, you know, also, it can uh, often be foolishly hopeful, like, you know, the world should be better, like we should have solved climate change, there should be world peace, we should all love each other more. Um, all of these are kind of, you know, very idealistic statements that uh, really don't do much except just give us this sense of righteousness when we say them. I'm, I'm hoping to use the word should here in a different way in the sense that uh, more about the fact that uh, potential exists, and that potential could be made use of in a way that is not unrealistic or highly idealistic. In a lot of ways, it's about awareness and availability of opportunities. Uh, engagement at the local and state level should be compelling in the sense that uh, there should be more attention paid to them. There should be more awareness of the opportunities that are there. Uh, there should be um, incentives uh, and I would say sort of societal expectations that people do get involved at this level. One thing I will note is that at the beginning of the American experiment, in the first, say, 40 or 50 years, engagement in politics at the local level was extremely high. Uh, and part of the wariness among the anti-federalists for establishing this large national government uh, and this overarching federal system was that uh, there would be a shift in the center of gravity away from local and state politics to national politics. And in fact, that is what has happened. Um, there's been a shift in the center of gravity away from politics at the close communal level, uh, where people can actually interact with each other. And uh, even if they don't see all of the people that they're involved with in the political system, they're close at hand. Uh, and there has been a shift in the center of gravity away from that. Um, early in the American experiment for the first, say, 30 or 40 years, Participation and involvement in politics was very high. One of the things that comes out in uh, the de Tocqueville's um, Democracy in America, this was a uh, classic work written by a French aristocrat who was touring the United States during the Jacksonian era, uh, you know, examining the, he was, he was uh, 
trying to get ideas for prison and penal reform for France, but he also was just a keen political sociologist and observed uh, everything around him and wrote this big, long, classic book. One of the things that comes out about that was his amazement at how politicized American society was, how much people talked about politics all the time and were engaged. And this was as he moved from community to community throughout the United States, he saw essentially a very politicized people. Uh, and this was, in fact, also a peak period of engagement, uh, though voter turnout rates wouldn't peak until the late 1800s. Um, but there was a lot of uh, engagement at that time, and it was mostly at the local and state level. And that's, in fact, how Andrew Jackson became a very uh, powerful um, and influential figure, is that he tapped into the grassroots. Grassroots politicking uh, at, you know, by parties really stems from the Jacksonian era when Jackson invented he and Martin Van Buren invented the Democratic Party um, and really reached into the local and state level and the energy that was there and the engagement. So it's not unprecedented in American history, and we can see throughout uh, the American experiment a shifting away from that. None of the things that made that possible uh, and that made that compelling back then are gone. Um, we do have a more mobile society, and so people don't uh, spend their entire lives, they're not born, uh, live, and die within the same communities, and so there are looser community ties. Um, we do also have a more mobile society in the sense that we can get around more easily, and it's easier to get to, to far away places. Um, we also have now electronic media that allow us to see things that are happening around the world instantaneously, and so our entire scope of life is not the, you know, the 15 miles around us that we can get to in a day's ride on a horse or in a cart. So things have changed in that sense. But what hasn't changed is that an awful lot still goes on at the local and state level um, where there are these opportunities. Uh, and as I say in the first bullet point, there are multiple channels of interaction and influence. There are still all of these forms of local and state government. In fact, there are more forms now than there were back then. Uh, now we have things like school boards, port commissions, uh, utility districts. Uh, we don't have those in Oregon, but they have them in Washington state. Uh, there's counties, there's cities, uh, there's of course the state government. There are special governments like our Metropolitan Council here in the Portland metropolitan area. There are all kinds of channels uh, that people have into the political system that are right here. Uh, they're close to home, they're easily accessible, uh, and one of the things about them is because they are largely invisible, <clears throat> there are probably a lot of people in the, in the Portland metropolitan area who don't even know what the Metropolitan Council is, uh, what it does. Uh, it actually runs the TriMet Metro system. It runs the zoo. It runs the convention center. Uh, it owns a lot of land. It does the uh, uh, urban planning. There's a ton of stuff, and I, I don't even know everything the Metropolitan Council does. Um, most of these forms of government, uh, even if people are aware of them, seem you know inaccessible, but that's actually the opposite of the case. And because so few people are aware of them in an ongoing way and participate in them, you can actually have a major impact uh, with a relatively low input of energy and time uh, and money. Um, and a small group of people can have a pretty major influence in these local forms of government. This is true for uh, at almost every community level that if you show up at all, just as an individual, uh, you will be uh, one of the few voices that the people making decisions hear, and policymakers make their decisions partly on what they think is right and partly on the listening that they do to the community. Uh, and the reason why that's important too and powerful is that local policymakers, because they actually live in the communities where they are making decisions and where what they're making decisions for. They really want to do a good job. They have to live in the place that they are making policy for. This is one of the things that's not true for uh, national politicians. They, they don't live in their states or their communities. I mean, they have residences there, and they come back, and they have offices. So there is that geographic connection. But they mostly live in Washington, D.C., and their perspective is from that distance and from that place. And the policies that they are enacting, of course, have an impact on the entire nation, Congress, what Congress does impacts the entire nation, but those people themselves aren't living in those communities. Uh, if you are on a local school board, even a big one like Portland uh, Public Schools, um, 
the your children are going to that school system or if you happen to be a person who then sends your kids to private school actually which would be terribly hypocritical but also not that crazy um your uh your friends kids go to that school system the kids in your neighborhood go to that school system so you are directly uh, um, impacted and you not only are directly impacted you see that you're around the people who have to live out the consequences of your decisions. Uh, and what that means is that you're just bound to be more uh, um, likely to, one, care about the impact of those decisions and really want to make them well and make them carefully, and two, you're more apt to listen to the people who are around you who are going to be impacted by those. Um, so, uh, you know, a city council meeting or a school board meeting or a community uh, parks uh, department meeting, um, a metro council meeting, the people who go to that aren't just there to make noise and to get good film for the nightly news or to kind of just get it off their chest and, and say what they want to say and, and, and yell and make noise. They're actually there to get their voices heard, and their voices are heard. Uh, when a member of Congress, particularly a senator, comes back to the state or the district and holds a town hall meeting, there really is a certain aspect of political theater to that where they're not really there to listen. They're there to seem like they're listening. They're there to, you know, give their constituents an opportunity to get things off their chest. But they're not necessarily on that sort of deep fact-finding mission. Uh, now that's not to say that people who work and who are elected to Congress at, at the national level aren't people who want to pay attention to their constituents, they're, that they're not uh, interested in hearing those voices, that it is all political theater. It's just that their daily working lives, they're surrounded by other people. They're surrounded by lobbyists. They're surrounded by other national politicians. They're surrounded by uh, staffers who are people who've moved to Washington, D.C. to work in high politics. So their daily working life is not enmeshed in this community, and they are therefore less apt to be influenced by those voices. Plus, also, they represent a lot more people, and so they have a lot more things to take into account. Uh, when you are on a local school board, you live among the people who you represent, and you actually, uh, there are a smaller number of them, and you can take them more into account, and there's just this like likelihood or desire to actually pay attention to them. Um, so that's why there could be more compelling engagement at the local level is that it's not so daunting, you know, and it's not so unlikely to have an impact. Most people aren't necessarily aware that if you're one of the 15 people who goes and speaks at a city council meeting, that that's more than just political theater. That that's more than just you going and spouting your outrage or your desire, that that's going to have uh, an important impact on the people who are actually making the decisions. Uh, there are, uh, I would say, two other reasons why uh, engagement at this level could and should be compelling. One is that you can often vote directly on laws. Uh, this is true in Oregon. This is true in about half the states. Um, it's it's not just true at the state level. It's also true at the county and the city level uh, that there are ballot measures where you as a citizen can actually get something on the ballot by uh, writing a ballot measure, collecting up, uh, b building a coalition, collecting up the necessary signatures, and getting the thing you want directly on the ballot. So you don't have to run for and win election to a public office to actually have an impact on the policy outcome in these states that have direct democracy. Um, and even if you uh, don't have that opportunity, you're in a state that doesn't have that, or in addition, if you are in a state, there are many positions that are available and they're relatively easy to gain. This is the final bullet point. You know, it's, it's not that they're super easy to gain, um, but there are lots of positions available to people. So, so there are thousands of public officials working in Oregon alone at the local and county level. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's thousands of positions here just in our state at those levels. Nationwide, there are tens of thousands. There are roughly 6,000 uh, state legislators nationwide. Um, and that's an awful lot of people, though, in a country of 350 million people. That's still a, a small percentage. But there are, in addition to that, tens of thousands of other public uh, positions, both elected and appointed, that regular people can get. You don't necessarily have to be an expert. I mean, some of those positions are for trained experts. Like, you know, a city manager of a mid-sized city gets hired by the city council. That person has had to go get training as a city manager. That's accessible to regular people. And those city managers are, in fact, regular people who live in the communities that they are uh, um, making policy for. But there are lots of positions that are available. Some of them are paid. Some of them are semi-volunteer you know, semi where they're paid a little bit. Some of them are actually full-time positions. 
All of them, however, are policymaking positions that are impactful. Now, they're not the same impact as the governor of a state. They're not the same impact as a U.S. senator or a member of the House of Representatives or a person who's in the uh, Oregon state legislature, but that doesn't mean that they have no impact. It just means that their impact is closer to home and it is uh, really more tied to the community, uh, but it does, those decisions affect the lives of the people around them. Now, the national level uh, is, you know, obviously very different. It's high visibility, it gets lots of coverage and attention, and that's one of the opportunities. It's one of the things that draws people into national politics is that it's the show. You know, it's, it's, it's like the big game where people say, okay, that's where you can go to really make a big splash. Additionally, there are lots and lots of different inputs into the national system. You don't just have to run for Congress to have an influence. You can uh, be part of an interest group that lobbies or that, uh, uh, that um, generates uh, voter drives for their members. Uh, you can do, there's a lot of ways that you can get involved in national politics. Not quite as many as there are to get involved with local and state politics. Uh, and it's also very highly competitive. But all of these levels are highly competitive. But um, there are many groups that are working. So there are lots of opportunities. You don't just have to run for Congress to have an impact on national politics. Um, and of course, and this is true, the third bullet point here is true for both levels. But it's it should be noted that... Uh, this is definitely true at the national level, is there are positions that are available to everybody, um, elected, appointed, and hired. Uh, and the hired part is actually probably the easiest, in, the easiest road into national politics. And there are possibly some of you in this class, because many students who study political science as undergraduates have a desire to go and get jobs in D.C. in some capacity or another, or to go to their state capital, or to do so at the, at the city level. But at the national level, you can go. You can get an internship. You can go get hired to be a staffer. You're going to be underpaid and overworked, of course. But there are plenty of opportunities that are available to all people, and they really are um, elected positions, of course, you have to get elected, but uh, appointed and hired positions are very much done on a meritocratic basis. The best people, the hardest workers, the smartest, the best trained, they tend to get these positions. Now, of course, you know, people get those positions because they're somebody's son or daughter or because they're somebody's brother or sister or, the, you know, somebody's colleague. That happens as well. So it's not 100% meritocratic. Connections always do help no matter what. But uh, if you have zero connections, um, you can still have the possibility to go get a job in national politics in Washington, D.C. Um, and of course, the real draw of national politics is that you have a major impact. Uh, when you get something done, uh, you have a national impact. And that is one of the things that draws people to Washington, D.C. Other things that draw them there, of course, are the power and the excitement. But a big piece of it is that there's a big impact when you can, you know, you get a job as a staffer for a senator and you help craft a piece of legislation that gets uh, ultimately passed. That's you have been part of a team that has done something that's, that has national impact and has a big, long lasting impact. So that's really why engagement at that level is compelling. And of course, because it's competitive and because it's high stakes, it's also potentially intimidating. Um, and uh, it, it, it can seem like, well, you know, I, it's, it's like becoming a major league baseball player. It's like, well, you know, I, I just can't do that. The thing about politics, though, is unlike sports or, uh, say, Hollywood uh, or television, where, you know, the very few people that you see on the TV screens are the only ones who are having an impact, there are plenty of behind-the-scenes roles at the national level. You don't have to be one of the 535 members of Congress or the president to have an impact on national politics. Whereas, you know, if you're not on the court on the M in, for an NBA team, you know, it's like the guy who wipes down the court or the guy, the, you know, the, the, uh, the ball carrier and all the, the water boy. These people don't really have the same kind of impact on uh, professional basketball as staffers uh, on, in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill have. So there really is only, only the, in those other high stakes competitive endeavors, there really are only those high visibility positions. In politics, that is not the case at all. There are plenty of completely invisible positions, and that's actually one of the problems with them, is that they're often invisible, but, they're, but their invisibility doesn't mean that they're not impactful. Now, moving over to the obstacle side of uh, the column here, I would say that one of the, I would say, differences in uh, between national and uh, local and state politics is the level of visibility. And this is, this is the, what it creates a perception of difference. 
So uh, on the obstacle side for local and state, I have low level of visibility, um, lack of education and messaging about uh, these levels, perception of small impact, uh, sense that money always wins. Um, all of these are, I would say, misperceptions about what goes on at the local and state level. Of course, money is important, but time and energy are, are equally important, or if not more important, at the state and local level. And because a small group of people uh, with uh, who, who input a relatively small amount of time and energy can actually have an impact, money doesn't always win. And in fact, uh, at the local and state level, a group of people without equal financial resources to another group of people can actually hope to compete with them. At the national level, it's much harder to compete if you don't have some at least minimal uh, and often very large amount of financial resources. So the first four bullet points here on the obstacle side of local and state, I think really all have to do with perception. And answering the question, why don't more people get involved at this level, is that local and state politics are largely invisible. They seem... Uh, pointless. Uh, they're, they seem like you're not going to get much done because it's just local and state. It's not the thing that we see on television. Um, and it's like, and money always wins in politics anyway. So why would I, why would I bother going into something where I'm going to lose? And where even if I don't lose, I'm going to have a very small impact. All of these are notions that people working inside local and state politics know are false. This is one of the things that uh, over the course of my teaching career, I've had a chance to talk to many, many people who work mostly in local and state politics. That's the access that I have. I don't have access to very many people who work in national politics. I've had access to people who work at the local and state level. In fact, many of you students uh, often do work at these levels, legislative internships, uh, working for campaigns for city council members, getting involved in community groups, uh, lobbying uh, you know, the Multnomah County Commission. Uh, the people who actually do this all say this, they say many similar things, but the similar thing they always say is that um, you really can do an awful lot and there's a common misperception about these levels of government that they're pointless uh, and that, uh, they're, uh, that they're just hardly worth it and that they don't do much. And the opposite is true. Most laws are made at the state and local level. Most policies are carried out at the state and local level. We just don't see them because we see what comes to us through the national political media, which is largely fixated on uh, the national level. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like most people aren't going to go watch a, you know, minor league softball game. They're going to watch the major league baseball game. People aren't going to necessarily say, oh, hey, you know, my community has a local hockey team. I'm going to go support my local hockey team and cheer for them. Um, but, you know, because I, if, I'm going to root for the NHL team. The, the difference in perception at the sporting level, I think, carries over to politics. And in those cases, it's not the same. The analogy breaks down because, true, whoever wins, say, the intramural hockey league championship in Multnomah County, is, it's really just not that important or impactful. Of course, to the people playing for that championship, it is important and impactful. But it doesn't really impact the community very much. Um, the, that is not true about local and state politics. The decisions made at this level are, are even more impactful on the community often than what goes on in Washington, D.C., because they're doing, making so many decisions, doing so much. Much of it, however, is invisible. It just isn't seen, and so this level of politics is less compelling. So why don't more people get involved? Well, because it's, it, it's, it's invisible, it seems pointless. Um, at the national level, the disempowerment is, I would say, more, this is something I've probably covered pretty well already in the previous lecture, so I'll just, uh, just you know, touch on it very quickly. The disempowerment at the national level is, in a way, it's correct. Uh, bullet point number one here, you can't vote directly on laws. The only way things get done at the national level is through Congress and through the executive branch and through the federal courts. Those are not directly accessible to citizens. And in fact, they are also then, uh, because we can't vote directly on laws, uh, we can't vote directly even on uh, judges, there are so many avenues of influence that are essentially closed to direct political action. Um, and then the other bullet points here are that, you know, there seems to be a pretty big distance between the people who are making decisions at the national level and the people that are having to live out the consequences of those decisions. Um, and that is the case. I mean, this is one of the things about uh, representatives in D.C. And I've, I've talked to people who, mostly students, but also people who've worked at policy making positions, uh, that student interns talk about the fact that you get to D.C. and back home seems very far away. 
um, there is a distance, there is a disconnection. Uh, what the, the politics in D.C. Can, can feel very much like it has almost nothing to do with life back home, and then you forget about life back home. So this, uh, I would say that the perception that makes local and state politics less compelling is incorrect. The perception that makes uh, national politics intimidating and daunting is in fact correct, is that there, there is this real distance. Um, and uh, there is the, a very remote likelihood of having a major impact on the policies that are being made. Um, and money seems to be the dominant factor in success at the, at the national level. It, and I say seems because it still isn't. There still are ways to win in politics at the national level that don't involve uh, having the most money. Um, but it, it's for sure the case that in order to play in national politics, you need at least a certain amount of financial resources. Uh, otherwise, your, your impact is going to be completely neg negligible, if not uh, utterly zero. So the perceptions that create obstacles for people getting engaged at the national level. And then even just like, I don't have this on the list anywhere, but the difference in the power of your vote. You know, one vote in a presidential election is virtually meaningless, particularly when you're in a safe state. You know, those of us in Oregon, uh, Joe Biden's going to win the Electoral College vote. So our vote here doesn't really matter. If you really want to have an impact on the presidential election, you need to move to a swing state, an important swing state like Pennsylvania or Florida or Wisconsin. Um, but even there, your vote is still one of hundreds of thousands or millions. Whereas when you're voting in a local school board election or when you're voting in a city council election, when you're voting in a, a county commissioner election or a sheriff's election um, or a city uh, um, district attorney election, your vote, while still one of you know thousands, so it's still numerically in terms of fractions, it's pretty small, it is way less small. Um, so the perception at the national level is largely accurate that it's harder uh, there's a greater level of disconnection. You're not likely to, to win unless you're part of a well-financed, large uh, interest group. And so the obstacles there that keep people from being engaged actually make a lot of sense. Um, so that's, I would say, this, the survey of, why, of the comparison between these two boils down to the fact that at the local and state level, there's a misperception that the, these, uh, the, the decisions being made here are insignificant and that you can't have an, uh, an impact and that they're really not accessible. They are significant, you can have an impact, and they are extraordinarily accessible. Um, all right, well, I think that's probably a good way to end this lecture, and uh, I guess that it has to be a good way to end the course because it's the final lecture. I appreciate everybody following along with this class and taking this summer class uh, in such a bizarre environment. And I hope that you've gotten an awful lot out of it.